Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 23rd Hinsey Lecture. It's lovely to see you all here. Uh, and it's also lovely to have at least 75, that was about five minutes ago, people online. So we're, you know, we're doing this all uh, virtually as well as live. Um, and uh, before I introduce Catherine, I just want to welcome the group for the International School on the Rhine that are in the middle row there. It's very nice to have you with us. Thanks for coming. Uh, it just, you know, I don't know how you got the message, but it's wonderful that you did. So welcome, welcome to you. Um, okay, so uh, you will probably all recall that um, Professor Catherine Haymans, the astronomer of Scotland, was going to give this lecture. But poor Catherine got COVID about six or seven weeks ago, and she now has long COVID, which is not nice at all. And uh, she's really struggling with that and gave me some indication a couple of weeks ago that she might not come and about a week ago that she really couldn't <coughs> possibly do it. So um, that's a pity, uh, and we will invite her again. So it's coming attractions. So I'm enormously grateful. I can't tell you how grateful I am to Professor Catherine Blundell for stepping in to do this lecture. I mean, that in itself would be enough, wouldn't it, stepping in to do the lecture? But I have to say, she's not only stepped in to do the lecture, but about, what, four hours ago, I think, she stepped off the plane from India. So, so Catherine is uh, doing a wonderful job for us. She's a research fellow at St. John's College and currently the Gresham Professor of Astronomy. Her research interests range from the evolution of active galaxies, accretion onto black holes, relativistic jets, and, uh, and uh, astrophysical plasmas. She works across the ele electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum and operates a network of telescopes known as Global Jet Watch. After doing her PhD in Cambridge, she's held a number of posts here, starting with a junior research fellowship at Balliol, and before she joined the permanent staff, she was a Royal Society University Research Fellow. Her work's been widely recognized, both for her, her contributions to education and her contributions to research. So in 2010, she won the Royal Society's Rosalind Franklin Medal for promoting women in STEM subjects. In 2012, the Institute of Physics Bragg Medal for achievements in physics education. And in 2015, she was the Royal Astronomical Society's Darwin Lecturer. In 2017, Her Majesty the Queen appointed her to, the, to OBE for services to astronomy and the education of young people. It is my great pleasure, and I say that with feeling, to introduce <laughs> Professor Catherine Blundell to deliver the 23rd Hinsey Lecture, Our Galaxy, Close Encounters in Turbulent Times. Catherine. Thank you very much, everybody. Good evening, and thank you, Roger, for your very kind introduction. Our galaxy is teeming with activity, dynamical interactions and explosions. You could be forgiven for thinking that was very far from being the case if, I'm just trying to work out how to turn the lights down. Here we go, whoops, managed to press the wrong button. Let's try that. You could be forgiven for not drawing that conclusion at all on the basis of looking at the night sky. This is an image with my digital DSLR camera, and one is struck, I think, by the beauty and the serenity of the night sky rather than anything to do with violence or explosions. However, if we look more deeply, then there is absolutely no doubt that our galaxy is teeming with interactions. This image shows um, the, uh, the span of the Milky Way, our galaxy. There's a couple of little local external galaxies in the, the lower right-hand side. But that's the span of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And the brightest cluster within that, that I've indicated with a pink arrow, the Carina Nebula, in particular, is so dynamic and so interactive that I personally have written several papers in the last few years just on that tiny region of sky. So how, how do we get to the close encounters that I referred to um, in my title? The close encounters that I'm going to talk about are truly violent and dynamic, but I want to begin with a very charming close encounter that maybe you remember occurring just before 
the first um, uh, Christmas in lockdown. I'm showing here um, an image of uh, Jupiter and Saturn, which you may remember, um, from December 2020. And I'm showing a, a time lapse of three images taken roughly 24 hours apart, giving rise to um, a particular movie. I think you might have a problem with the sound, but I, yes. I'm not getting it. Uh, are people having problems with feedback or? It's a little odd. Can we do something about the sound? Can we do something about the sound? It's a little odd and we'll have to do it. It's a slight effort. <laughs> I'll carry on. So there's a, there was a rather charming close encounter of Jupiter and Saturn just before the first Christmas of lockdown. Some of you may remember it if you're lucky enough, if you were lucky enough to live under cloud-free skies at the time Jupiter and Saturn were doing their fly past. But of course, this wasn't a particularly close encounter. Jupiter and Saturn were still separated by the difference of their orbits around our sun, some 400 million miles. A true close encounter is when the objects following the encounter have been a bit rattled and undergone um, a bit of a different experience. But how do we begin to study those dynamical interactions and those violent explosions? It's not just by taking images of the kind that I've shown you thus far. There's a really important tool in the toolkit called spectroscopy. Now, spectroscopy is really all about rainbows. And if you're a fan of rainbows, then you're going to love this part of the talk. Rainbows happen when uh, water droplets in a cloud disperse sunlight into their constituent colors. It's actually not very desirable um, that rainbows follow uh, observatories around because it's a sure sign that you've got cloud rather than clear sky around. But nonetheless, a rainbow is simply the dispersed spectrum of sunlight. Joseph Fraunhofer, some years ago, dispersed sunlight into, um, into a spectrum and found a number of different prominent features. For example, these two very sharp, dark lines against a background spectrum arising from the element sodium in the sun. Now, that's a characteristic orangey color, which you may recognize from some of the street lights that we have in Oxford. The particular color that you get from a particular element is an extremely sensitive spectral fingerprint of the element in question. I'm showing here some different example spectra of different elements that I hope will persuade you that if, if you've got a good spectrum of a particular element, you can totally identify what is present. So now let's take a look at what happens if we split up light from other stars, not just our nearest star, the sun. So I hope you can see um, the, uh, I, I wonder if some of you can indeed recognize this rather famous constellation. Um, this is in fact Orion, just for anyone who's slightly struggling with, with that, let me just put circles around it. What I did here was to put um, a transmission grating um, on the lens of my um, digital camera, just so that I split up the light from each of the stars in Orion. If I zoom into those, then you can see that we get a rainbow, somewhat resembling the dispersed spectrum that we get from our sun. So this is Betelgeuse, and um, this is uh, Rigel from the opposite corner um, of Betelgeuse. Now the differences between the rainbows or spectra of those two stars, Rigel and Betelgeuse, compared with the sun, are principally dominated by what the temperature of those single individual stars is not as interesting as dynamics, as we'll see shortly. If I now um, draw your attention to the spectrum um, associated with M M42, Messier 42, then, and if I zoom into that, then I wonder if you can see that that spectrum is a little bit different because it's got brighter peaks corresponding to the red and the green light. Um, and these arise from uh, hydrogen 
and oxygen. So what we're seeing, so M42 is not a star, it's a nebula, which is a cloud of gas. Those two lines are telling us about the quantity of hydrogen and the quantity of oxygen that we've got in that nebula. And if they were wiggling around, then they would be telling us about the dynamics in that nebula. Now with added arrows. Now if I take you to that that little cluster in the Milky Way that I illustrated with a pink arrow earlier on, and zoom in. Uh, this is an image from one of my telescopes in Australia. This is an image of that Carina region, taken just in light emitted by hydrogen atoms. There is a lot of dynamic activity associated with the brightest star um, in this region. And it's not just a bright single star. It's much more interesting than that. These days, it's a binary star system, two, or, two stars orbiting around one another. And they have particularly close encounters with one another. And so, what you want to do with something that's orbiting and dynamically interacting is to observe it via spectroscopy. So the tool of choice is a spectrograph which disperses starlight, not with raindrops in a cloud, but with a grating. A grating will split up the light into those rainbows that I showed you, and then you can identify peaks in the spectrum and see how they move around and which elements you've got present. I'll be explaining in just a moment that how light lines move around is a very direct measure of their speed. So if you're not familiar with thinking about spectrographs, then I'd like you to hear when I say the word spectrograph, the word speedometer. One way to think about this is that if we go back to those sodium street lamps that the streets of Oxford are littered with, and you think of that characteristic orange color that I illustrated a few moments ago, if we were to nail one of those orange street lamps, sodium street lamps, onto the back of a rocket and whoosh it away from Earth, then actually we wouldn't be seeing that orange light from the street lamp as orange, we'd be seeing it as red, as though the wavelengths were much longer. And this phenomenon is well known to physicists as the Doppler effect. This is, of course, to do with optical light changing color according to how it's moving away from us. It's entirely analogous to that audio process that happens when an ambulance is hurtling towards us and we hear its siren at a higher pitch or higher frequency, shorter wavelength, and when it's going away from us, if we've got out of the way, of course, and we hear it at a lower note, a lower pitch, a longer wavelength. So this phenomenon, the Doppler effect, is precisely what enables us to use a spectrograph as a speedometer. The spectrum that I'm showing here, um, this very central green line, is light arising just from uh, fairly stationary hydrogen atoms, but the blue one uh, is still light from hydrogen, but it's, it's arising from hydrogen gas that's moving towards Earth. The red one is arising from hydrogen moving away from Earth. And so when we see those lines move away from the normal rest position where the, uh, the, the tall green line is, then we're measuring those speeds increasing, coming faster and faster towards Earth, and going faster and faster away from Earth. So back to that Carina region that I indicated with the pink arrow at the start of my talk, and we're talking about the very brightest star which is in there. This is an image taken from my Chile observatory, just with a pair of auxiliary cameras, commensal cameras that are bolted to the telescope, um, shown here, uh, same instrumentation at my India Observatory with some Indian schoolgirls shown for scale. What are these observatories all about, I hear you ask? They're about what Roger referred to, the Global Jet Watch. This is a globally distributed program that I set up in order to monitor how matter gets attracted and expelled from black hole systems and to explore the close encounters and dynamical interactions in our galaxy that I've been referring to. When I say global, whoops, let's just go back. When I say global, 
ideally the Earth would rotate. There we go. Um, when I say global, there are five telescopes separated in longitude so that there's always um, one of them in darkness, able to keep the watch going on a very distant part of the galaxy when um, telescopes the opposite side of Earth are in daytime. This distribution of telescopes mean that I can monitor rapidly varying optical transient systems, which are those that are changing, that are dynamically interacting and um, uh, in some cases exploding. All good stuff. How do you go about building observatories? Starting point is lots of concrete and spanners. I broke all my fingernails building uh, these telescopes. This is the top end of the one in Chile. This is the back end showing you our instrumentation in uh, that's South Africa, I think. Uh, this is the one in India uh, showing squirrel-proof uh, vents over the primary mirror fans and various bits of our instrumentation. And uh, on the concrete floor, these shiny red boxes are um, my spectrographs with that all-important dispersion grating providing the role of the raindrops in the cloud to disperse uh, starlight uh, so that we can see what's going on and explore the dynamics. So uh, that's the telescope in Western Australia. And um, this is the whole set um, of telescopes. So it, it's, it, I designed this and set this up precisely so that I could pursue my research interests in the areas that I've mentioned. And there's absolutely no shortage of um, rich behavior to explore in our galaxy. These are just some of the images, this one from Chile, this one from Western Australia. But I really want to focus on this Carina Nebula um, tonight and uh, zoom in a little more. If we take a spectrum of um, Eta Carina, we get lots and, uh, which is this very, very bright star here, we get lots and lots of peaks and spikes corresponding not just to hydrogen and to oxygen, but to all sorts of other elements, helium and lithium and uh, all manner of things uh, from silicon um, all the way up to nitrogen and iron. It's an extremely rich spectrum and we've studied it in great detail, um, most especially with um, my now graduated um, uh, doctoral student, David Grant. And as a result of um, the orbital interactions of Eta Carina, which, as I said, is a binary star system, as it orbits around one another, the two stars that are part of that, um, both of them emitting um, very, very strong winds, much like our solar wind, um, losing lots and lots of matter and material. You'll notice that what's going on in this movie uh, that David Grant, my former student, prepared, um, is, is not really very uh, constant in time. There's a sort of jerk every period um, in time. Now, this movie is very, very much speeded up. Um, the actual uh, orbital period of this system is about 2,023 days, over five years. So it's precisely sustained observations which are finely time-resolved that are necessary for us to figure out what's going on. But why this sudden jerk, and why is it far from being smooth? What's going on? Well, that has to do with the geometry of the orbit of Eta Carina. Most orbits are not a priori likely to be circular. In fact, most of them are likely to be um, ellipses. Now, an ellipse is the shape that you get when you intersect a cone with a surface, a plane, that isn't perpendicular to the symmetry axis of the cone. If you do intersect a cone with a horizontal plane perpendicular to that symmetry axis, then you get a circle. And it's an amazing thing that all the different orbits that we see in outer space, circles, ellipses, parabolas, hyperbolas, these all arise, these all can be described by how a plane might intersect with a cone. This is a description, this is a, an image which shows the different shapes you get according to a parameter E, which stands for the eccentricity of a system. If you've got an orbit with eccentricity zero, that's circular. If you've got a much higher number, then it's much more eccentric. 
the guy who realized that these geometric shapes arose from intersecting a cone with a plane at different angles was a, a very stony-faced guy, I presume, on the basis of this, Apollonius of um, Persia. He was the guy who worked out that these so-called conic sections mapped to the orbits that real star systems and comets and all sorts of other good stuff exhibit in physical reality in outer space. Uh, here's a, a, a hyperbola and parabola, but back to the ellipse, back to the one that Eta Carina is exhibiting. Um, now, this is a little movie, or should be a little movie, of a very extremely eccentric system. The eccentricity of the movie that I'm showing you now has an eccentricity of 0 0.9. That's the eccentricity of Eta Carina, the binary star system. And all kinds of turbulent phenomena happen at the closest approach, um, which happens once every orbital period. That close encounter we refer to as periastron. When they're furthest apart, we refer to that as apastron. At all times, the two stars in orbit around one another are fully obeying Kepler's laws. In fact, most of the bodies in the solar system are orbiting on elliptical orbits, but the ellipticities or the eccentricities are very, very subtle, 0.01 or something, nothing like the 0.9 exhibited by Eta Carina and some of the other objects I'm going to refer to. That parameter E just goes into this very simple equation and all the different, um, all the different uh, shapes and orbits drop out. It's a beautiful equation. You change E, you've got the shape of the orbit that the stars are talking about. But I now want to talk about one of Eta Carina's neighbors. This is Gigi Carina. This is not so eccentric as Eta Carina. It has an orbital eccentricity of 0 0.5. Now, we're no longer talking about the brightest star in this region, we're talking about the, uh, in the pink box there, you can, if you think of the three brightest stars, there's a pair of bright ones together at the top. We're talking about the one on the left. That one is Gigi Carina. If you really zoom in, that itself is a binary, and that's what I'm talking about with Gigi Carina. Here are some examples of the spectra from, I uh, can't remember which telescopes they are, but the point I want to emphasize here is that we're talking about time-lapse spectroscopy. Not just a single spectrum which gives you speeds, but a time-lapse of spectra which gives you changing speeds. So the time-lapse image of, images of Jupiter and Saturn, that's all great and very, very charming. But I really want to emphasize that time-lapse spectroscopy is where you get huge insights into the dynamical uh, systems that are these binary stars. A lot of these uh, different uh, very pointy lines here arise from uh, silicon and iron. Some of them are oxygen. Um, if you take their positions, their sort of normal wavelength positions, and then you ask the question, every time I take a spectrum, how does that move around with time? And you get some very interesting answers. If you make all those measurements and you say, you know, on Tuesday, five o'clock, let's make the measurement. Okay, now let's make it again at seven o'clock, nine o'clock. Go throughout the whole nicthemeron of 24 hours, repeat until, um, and go through uh, the entire month and the entire year and so on and so forth. You get these time-lapse spectra and you can start to ask questions about how these wavelengths change with time. If you want to ask the question, okay, what are the characteristic rattling time scales? What are the periodicities? exhibited um, by these, um, uh, all these uh, different emission lines, um, you apply a mathematical process that we refer to as making, taking a Fourier transform. And so then you can plot something called a periodogram. Don't worry if you haven't heard about this sort of thing before, but what this serves up for you is the time scales on which you've got rattling around. So the tall spike on the left corresponds to 31 days. That's the time scale for the two stars within GG the GG Carina binary to orbit around one another 
on their 0.5 eccentricity. We were expecting to see this. This was work with my also now graduated uh, doctoral student, Augustus Porter. We were expecting to see that 31-day period. It's been known for decades. But we weren't expecting the other periodicity, which corresponds to about 1.5 days. It was easy to miss previously because previously it wasn't so easy to get such high quality sampling in time. But we saw this very, very clearly. Um, I'm just showing you, this is uh, an example of that rattling around in wavelength um, or uh, color, which is um, plotted on the vertical axis there. You can see a very, very clear signal of this moving around on a time scale which is really short by these standards. It's 1.5 days, much, much shorter than the orbital time scale for these guys to orbit around one another. We saw this in practically every single line, every single peak in the spectra that we observed round the clock, day after day. How could this arrive, arise so different from the orbital period? Well, we looked at photometric data streams, photometry meaning how bright is the thing and how does the brightness change with time, uh, from a satellite uh, that's flying up in space referred to as TESS. Now, this is a little bit of a jumbled plot, but if you just look at the top panel for the minute, these are all data from the TESS satellite. Um, the orange line going up and down on the top panel is it's not a spectrum at all. It's telling you how the brightness goes up and down with time. The blue line is telling you what happened the following month. Now, if you just zoom in a little bit, you can see that the phases of those variations are completely different from one another. So what's happening and what's going on? Well, because we understood in great detail what the orbital elements of this system were, by the way, we com completely refuted um, what had been in the literature previously, we were able to determine with absolute certainty when the close encounter happened, when the periastron happened, and we were able to associate the enhanced variability that you can see with that close encounter with periastron. We were exciting, or sorry, not we, Gigi Carina was exciting fundamental vibration modes in the star, which was contracting, causing it to contract and expand and thereby vary in brightness when you got this close encounter, this fly past at periastron. Now, if that doesn't mean very much to you, stay with me. Think of the following analogy. If you've got a panna cotta and you rattle it, it moves with a certain fundamental frequency. The analogy isn't perfect, but it will serve the purpose of saying that if you distort and apply torques to um, given systems, be it panna cotta or a big massive star, those are, those are fundamental characteristics of the system. And that's precisely what gets excited during the close encounters and the fly past. And so we've been able to study changing star systems um, in the galaxy, looking at patterns of change, steady change. But there's a different kind of change that happens in our galaxy. I'm talking now about stochastic change, sudden change, when things go bang and explode. And I'm talking particularly about stars that suddenly appear. So again, if we look back at the galactic plane, and over on the right-hand side, you can see those uh, red circles. That again is this Carina Nebula. If I zoom in on this um, same image that I showed you earlier, um, and then zoom in again in that pink box, I want you to look at those stars that are forming an L shape. One of those stars wasn't there previously, and I hope you can see that it's the one in the corner. Oops, uh, was was not there in um, in previous times. It suddenly appeared, and it was a type of star known as a nova. Now, the binary star systems that I talked to you about earlier are two normal, if very very massive, stars orbiting around one another. 
type of systems that I'm now going to talk about are a star orbiting around something we refer to as a compact object. It's an object that's compact. And the first example of this that I'm going to talk about is something called a white dwarf. So the system that we have is something like this. Um, you've got a, a very normal sort of star uh, shown in the, uh, represented by that white balloon there, and matter is ripped from that by the compact object. And by ver obeying various physical laws, uh, law of gravitational attraction, law of conservation of angular momentum, you form this kind of holding pattern, which I was in um, at Heathrow only four and a half hours ago, um, around the compact object, the white dwarf. Thankfully, I didn't get sucked into anything, and we landed safely. So this is an example of what we call the accretion of matter from a normal star onto a compact object. Now, if that compact object is a white dwarf, and I'll come to exactly what that is in a minute, if you accrete too much matter, it gets very hot. So hot that you can, that, that the material on the outermost surface of that compact object, the white dwarf, can in fact undergo nuclear fusion. If more and more matter is ripped off the normal star and goes flat onto the surface of the white dwarf, then you will get a thermonuclear runaway. Now that's very interesting in its own right because that gives rise to a process called nuclear synthesis, the fusion of new elements. And some of those are very, um, what we call very heavy elements. They are necessary for life itself. And so that's what a nova is. A nova, it comes from the Latin meaning new, a new star that suddenly appeared. It happens when that matter lands, splats onto the surface of the, the hard surface of the white dwarf, and it gets so hot that nuclear synthesis um, can take place and uh, new elements are formed. How much energy are we talking about here? We're talking about 10 to the power of uh, 37 joules of energy. Now, it's probably quite hard to calibrate exactly what we mean by that, um, but if I can take you back to July 1945, there was a big explosion at the Trinity site in White Sands in New Mexico. It was developed as part of the Manhattan Project. My husband and I visited it during our Easter holiday a few years back, and it was a very eerie experience. The sand in the desert was no longer grains of sand. It had fused together into lumps of glass. The temperatures that took place in that explosion um, melted the sand and gave rise to these pieces of stuff called trinitite. Well, the energy of that, though enormous, enough to melt sand into glass, was something like sorry, a nova was 10 to the power of 23 times more powerful than the Trinity site explosion. So a nova explosion is immensely powerful. But what is this object, a white dwarf, that I've been talking about? As I've said, it's an object that's compact and it has a hard surface. It's held up by something, by quantum mechanics, something we refer to as electron degeneracy pressure. There's no fusion within a white dwarf. Fusion is something that takes place in normal stars, of course, it gives rise to all their heat and light, but you can get fusion on the surface of a white dwarf if you attract enough matter from the normal star and if it gets hot enough to undergo nuclear fusion. But why does this process happen? How is it that matter can go splat onto the hard surface of a white dwarf? Well, it turns out that this business about the white dwarf being very compact is crucial here. The white dwarf is a very, very dense object. How dense are we talking about? Well, if you could take a heat tablespoonful of white dwarf material, that weighs the same as the family of elephants. Uh, this is a photo, another photo with my digital camera, not with a telescope. And I happened to take this photo on the day when this little guy had discovered he'd got a trunk you can tell that all the big elephants are being really grown up and trunks are pointing down into the river, drinking water because it's available, but this little guy, he discovered a trunk. But anyway, that family of elephants 
if you take the mass of that family of elephants, that's equal in weight to one tablespoonful of white dwarf material. So that is a nova explosion. It is different from a supernova explosion. That's actually much more powerful, but much more rare than a nova explosion. It arises from a much, much more massive star throwing off matter and collapsing. On average, we get one of these per century in the Milky Way, whereas you get a few tens of nova explosions in the galaxy every year. A supernova um, happens not when a star is born, but when a star dies. Um, and it can give rise to black holes. And that's the kind of system that I'll talk about presently. I want to tell you a little bit more about circular orbits, about different types of orbits, before we get to that. Now, here's another movie. Uh, apologies in advance if it mesmerizes anyone. Let me explain what we're talking about. The two white lines are orbits of a pair of stars, as we've discussed earlier in the talk, but the green line outside, outside of the binary, is known as a circumbinary orbit. Now you'll see that, so the one on the left is a sort of bird's eye view looking overhead, not that birds are widely used in astronomical measurements. Oops, something's happened with that one. Oh well, we'll look at the side ones. Um, on the right, we're looking at an edge-on um, movie of the exact same setup and system. And you'll notice that green line is moving and orbiting around. For years, people said, these can't be stable. These can't be a thing. These can't be happening. But it turns out, if you do your simulations in 3D, as I did with another graduated doctoral student, Sam Doolin, then these precisely conform stable orbits if you're sufficiently liberated about your definition of stability to say that actually that can process, it can um, move around like a frisbee that you've put a lot of spin on. So circumbinary orbiting material outside of a binary star system is something I have a long-standing interest in. This is now a spectrum of another nova uh, that we observed and you'll see these very characteristic shapes, um, these spectral shapes. And we examined the details of these spectral features, and we considered various different models. Could you have a rotating disk? Um, could you have a spiral? Could you have an expanding disk? But the only thing that fitted the data was a circumbinary disk, giving rise to this sort of characteristic capital M shape. We were pretty happy to, do, to discover this dynamical activity in that particular nova. But there was a more exciting discovery still to come, which is the fact that every single nova that the Global Jet Watch has ever looked at emits jets. It squirts out material in opposite directions. Um, my also now graduated doctoral student, Dominic McLaughlin, um, and I, along with Steve Lee and Chris McCarriage in Australia, Every single nova that we've looked at exhibits these jets for some oppositely directed jets squirting out from the vicinity of the nova shortly after the nova has detonated. Now, the speeds of these jets are relatively slow by astronomical standards, um, fast by the standards of the Boeing 777 that I was on earlier today. The speeds of those jets are a few thousand kilometers per second. And they process, which is to say that they waggle around in space. So that was a very happy discovery, which we made during the first lockdown. We thought it was very metaphorical that in all the turbulence and chaos of the thermonuclear runaway that takes place on the surface of the white dwarf, you should form these elegant, oppositely directed jets, which process in a very elegant way. We were very happy with that discovery. Procession of jets is well known in astronomy, and it's exemplified by a microquasar, a binary star system, whose compact object is a black hole. And if you look at the uh, lines, uh, the peaks in the spectra from these, you can actually see that they go backwards and forwards, corresponding to a change in direction along which the jet material is squirted. We know an awful lot, we can deduce an awful lot, 
from each individual spectrum. From, from one single spectrum of this object, we can determine the speed at which the material was launched from the vicinity of the black hole, coming towards Earth and going away from Earth, the blue shifted one and the red shifted one, and also the angle at which it, it is launched. And so we can completely determine the characteristics of that precession activity. Because we have a time lapse of spectroscopy, and because one of the things we know really well is the timestamp, the date when we took the spectra, we can use it to make predictions. And so what I'm showing here on this plot are four example spectra, but a whole lot more uh, fed into this on the bottom two panels and the top two panels. And with this, I made a prediction on the basis of those of all the spectra, hundreds of spectra that went into this, to say, well, if we were to observe an image of this system at some time in the future, from all the time-lapse spectroscopy, what would it look like? So that central panel is an a priori prediction on the basis of the time-lapse spectroscopy um, that happened in the year preceding uh, the image. The telescope I used to um, verify or refute my prediction was the ALMA radio telescope in northern Chile. And so that's my prediction, and that's physical reality. We were pretty happy um, when uh, we uh, realized that our prediction was correct. Let me emphasize this was an a priori prediction and not an a posteriori fit. So we're very confident in the spectral tools that we've built up. Well, in the final um, few minutes of my talk, I just want to tell you about a few spin-offs of the Global Jetwatch Observatories. Um, all of the uh, Global Jetwatch Observatories are located in the grounds of schools. And this is an image taken with my digital camera of schoolgirls at my South Africa telescope. There's always a huge amount of giggling um, in the observatories, I have to say, but a huge amount of fun uh, that can be had. So the paradigm is that, this again is uh, South Africa, the paradigm is that before local bedtime at each of those locations, the school children are free to play with the telescope. And I always use the verb to play because I want them to feel free to explore and not sort of panicked by the idea that this is some kind of formal learning experience and the lack of familiarity of being in a uh, circular room and with an unfamiliar technological system to control um, might hinder them from actually learning. It's my experience in all of these locations that if teenagers are having fun, they're in a place where they can learn. That's South Africa, this is India, um, seriously, they do observe wearing those pink shower kameezes, um, and they do really gain a huge amount in all sorts of ways from the experience of observing. Um, after local bedtime, I take over and remotely control um, the telescopes from Oxford or uh, from wherever I am, um, with some help from my colleagues in Australia when I'm asleep, when I'm asleep, because I do sleep sometimes. Um, I want to tell you a story about what happened one day when I was, I was doing some work in the India Observatory um, and these three little heads belonging to these three little schoolgirls um, sort of appeared around the observatory door and they said, Madam, Madam, can we ask you a question? I said, of course, you can ask me anything. And they said, Madam, how come you're not afraid to be in here, the observatory, by yourself? was pretty startled by this question. And so I said, well, I'm not afraid at all. Why did you think I might have been afraid? And they said, because of the machinery and all, madam. What if the telescope jumps out at you and attacks you? The reason why they asked that question was that the students at this school um, come from rural areas all across Karnataka. And if they were not at this particular government of India school, they would be working on the land harvesting rice. And they associate technology with machinery, and they associate machinery with being something that maims you. 
and paralyzes you and causes significant injury. And so I explained to them that the telescope is beautifully balanced and it moves like a ballerina and it's completely under the control of the control PC and, um, and that they should come back that night. And so sure enough, that night, they were exploring craters on the moon for themselves. So the skills that they gain in technology give them confidence that technology is not something to be frightened of. I've never encountered such a thirst for knowledge as I have at this particular school in India. This school is a government of India school founded so that the bright children of rural families who, as I said, would otherwise be working on the land can receive a formal education. 50% of them are first generation literates. And so I think that's why they have such a thirst for knowledge. They realize they're very, very privileged. And they are learning a huge amount about technology, about engineering, about science, um, all sorts of science, not just astronomy, um, but physics itself. One of the things that I've learned during this project is that unfortunately I can't clone myself, but Zoom is a thing, Skype is a thing. Um, in the top left, that's me at our study at home. This was the first time these two from the South Africa Observatory had ever observed. That's Jenna sitting down and Katie standing up. And the middle panel, this is a time lapse of their experience in the observatory. The middle panel is when they first steered the telescope and then this was their reaction the first time they imaged a galaxy. They have a huge amount of fun. Um, Jenna went off to do physics with astronomy at the University of Cape Town, and Katie went off to do nuclear physics. This is Lorraine and Nagisha again at South Africa. I'm going to share with you an email that came from a kid at the India School, uh, which was uh, pretty special. Dear Madam, um, hope you saw the image of Jupiter, that's the planet, it was magnificent. I don't teach them spelling. Um, we even saw, that's a list of different astronomical targets, including M42, that thing I showed you a little rainbow of earlier. Guess what, madam? Every night in my dream, I play only with stars and nebulas. Once I enter the observatory, I forget everything. I feel I have entered heaven. That's the kind of effect it has on these rural children. Now, you may be forgiven for thinking I was a bit disparaging about single stars at the start of my talk, and that I only have eyes for multiple star systems that are interacting and having close encounters with one another. But you'd be wrong. Single stars are really, really important. The most important one of those is our nearest star, the sun. Now, I had a big problem to solve at my India School Observatory, which I left about 24 hours ago. Uh, this is it here, by the way. So the white uh, thing at the top, that's the actual observatory on the school roof. And this is the academic block. There were various classrooms um, off that. I had a major, major problem at the India School Observatory, which was that the local mains electricity is often off. You can't do astronomy when, um, well, I mean, it's good that lights are out when you do astronomy, but if you can't control your telescope and your cameras and your instruments, you can't do anything. But the other problem was when the electricity there was on, it was so spiky, it would just destroy my cameras. And I had loads of expensive cameras destroyed. I installed UPSs that were expensive. They got destroyed by the spikes in the local electricity. So then I decided I couldn't stand it anymore. And I managed to raise the money to build a solar farm. So let me just tell you a little bit about this and how I make use of our nearest star. This is a picture of uh, the horse that delivered the steel with which I built a shed to store the batteries um, which store the, as chemical energy, the energy that we get uh, from the sun. Here's a picture of the battery shed. Um, here's a picture of some of the regulators inside there. I was bitten by mosquitoes in there only yesterday. I still bear the scars. Um, this shows you some of the system we've got and pictures of my two Australian colleagues testing the system out very, very carefully. We use lead acid batteries because they have the wonderful property that they're big and heavy and um, hard to steal. Um, so we have about 2,000 amp hours of uh, batteries stored in that shed 
uh, made of steel, delivered by the horse. This is the school roof with the uh, structures that support the photovoltaic panels that collect light energy from our nearest star, convert it into electrical energy, and it gets stored as chemical energy downstairs. It was very hot, hard work installing all of those, but here is our solar farm, and this is uh, with some uh, Indian schoolgirls for, for scale. This system is brilliantly reliable. It's as reliable as the rising of the sun. Happy days. So, in conclusion, close encounters on our planet can be pretty special too. Um, they produce profound changes in the aspirations of the students, broadening their horizons and lifting their aspirations, as evidenced by the fact that a lot of kids at the different schools have gone on to study physics or engineering or some other kind of science at higher level at a local college or university. And it's terrific to have these close encounters even in these turbulent times. And I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. You have shown us how to survey the skies as a function of time. And that is one of the things we do in the Hinsey Center for Astrophysical Surveys. Uh, in, in a fantastically exciting way, you also showed us how astronomy, or as well as bringing young people into science, can transform their lives, basically. And so that, that was a wonderful, uh, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. You did, however, say one thing which was completely unbelievable. I'm sure nobody in the room believes that you go to sleep. <laughs> um, let's take questions. We have, um, we, we have people monitoring the questions from the internet, from, from uh, online. But let's take questions from the room first. So at the back here. So we've got some mic runners. Thank you. And another one. So I can get the other mic runner. Second question. Yep, here. So that'll be so here first, and then here, and we'll always have one ahead. Okay, go on, Lauren. Hi, um, thank you for your talk, it was amazing. I was wondering, how did you choose the schools to put the observatories at? Um, with the help of friends. So step one was to get in touch with um, a local professional astronomer who was a mate of mine in all these different locations and to ask them to draw up a short list of schools in reasonably dark places. They don't have to be totally dark because the technique of spectroscopy means that you can identify contaminating light. Um, once I had, um, once a shortlist had been drawn up, discussed it with uh, a friend in uh, each of the places, um, I then went out to visit them with said friend and quizzed the, the principals, the, head the headmistresses and so on and so forth. And that was a very revealing process. It, as a result of interviewing, meeting with those people, and conversing with them, it became completely clear which were the right schools to choose and which were the wrong schools to choose. So for example, a question I posed in each case was, why would you be interested in hosting one of our telescopes? Now, an example of a, a terrible answer was, um, because we want to be able to brag to our neighboring schools that we've got a link with Oxford. So anyone who said that was just completely out of the picture. But the answer that the headmistress at the South Africa school gave to me, which was a winner, by the way, was um, in answer to the question, why would you like to host uh, one of our schools, uh, one of our um, observatories in your schools, um, was the following. She said, I want to see the girls of my school grow up to wear the white coats of South Africa in the future and be the medics and the scientists in this needy land. Thank you. Let's take this one here. Uh, yes. What um, spectrographic resolution do you need to be able to determine the velocity changes that characterize your orbits? Sorry, I think I slightly missed the first part. Oh, of the, the spectrographic resolution that you need to resolve the velocity changes that characterize the orbits. 
Thank you very much. So for the kind of systems that I'm talking about, the binary star orbits and so on and so forth, um, we need what are referred to as mid-resolution spectrographs. So um, the, uh, the resolution of our spectrographs is about 4,000. Okay, so we have a couple of questions from uh, those watching online. Oh, we can, oh, we got a, a microphone, Peter. Thank you. Okay, so we have a few general comments saying how inspiring that was. So thank you, including someone who's studying astronomy at the University of Hawaii remotely from India, which is quite impressive. Um, okay, there are a couple of questions about the 1.5 day period in I think Gigi Karina. Is that right? Um, so could you maybe say a little bit more about that? And specifically, so this is from Bill Phillips and Dean Brown, specifically uh, what kinds of excitation produces this period and at the edge of the Fourier transform it appeared there was a peak at about one day as well. Is that real? So just a bit more comment, I think, on the Gigi Carina sure, uh, periodogram. So the precise um, fundamental mode that's being excited is the F equals 2 mode. This happens, as I said, at periastron, i.e. when you get this close encounter of these two stars. So you get a, a quadrupole excited, and that gives rise to this uh, expansion and contraction that I referred to. You change the opacity, um, the photosphere changes in size, and that's why you get the oscillating brightness. Um, what we spotted was the fact that we got those, the amplitude of those 1.5 day periods was very, very enhanced at periastron, at closest approach. And it, it died out by the time you got to apastron at the opposite point um, in the orbit. Okay. Okay, so we have another question from Bill Phillips, which is that in the case of highly centric binaries, does the mass difference between the two stars play a role in, a, their, in their movement? Sorry, I think I didn't quite catch your question. Sorry, so it's the same question, it's a, it's a question from Bill. So in case of like highly centric binaries, how does the mass of the two stars influence their dynamics? Um, how, how do the masses of the stars influence their dynamics? Um, um, it, well, so, so the combination of the masses of the stars and their, uh, what we call their angular velocity gives rise to a property we refer to as the angular momentum. And that's, that's a conserved quantity, as we know, in all of physics. And the relationship between the angular momentum of the stars and the, the entire energy in the system is what ultimately gives rise to the, uh, the geometry of the system. Did you say the name of the questioner was Bill Phillips? Yeah. Is that Bill Phillips in um, Maryland? Yeah. I was wondering that too. <laughs> can, can you ask... A question to the Why don't you find that out? We'll take a couple of questions from the, from the uh, here we go, we've got a question from Johanna. Go ahead. Thanks a lot. That was a super interesting talk. I was wondering whether you could say a little bit about your survey strategy and how you decide uh, which targets to observe every night, because clearly there must be some sort of automatization, right? Um, there's a bit of a hierarchy, to be honest. Um, so the target that um, inspired the whole project was this microquasar system uh, called SS433, which squirts out these persistently processing jets. Um, that object gets special treatment. Basically, whenever it's a nighttime object, um, which is basically from March to about November, I'm, I'm just constantly gathering spectra on it. There are some other favorites as well. I'm, I'm interested in two particular manifestations. One is, one is jets, um, the other is circumbinary disks as well. Uh, so there are some other targets I, I haven't mentioned, um, but I also like explosions. So if, if a nova goes off, um, then I, I would tend to follow that really fairly intensively um, for the next few weeks. And then, and then when a nova has detonated, it's a bit of a balancing act to sort of it's a trade-off between that and um, some of the other targets. It, it's reasonably important to sustain the monitoring. Um, it, it's quite a well-known phenomenon in astronomy. I'm sure Roger would agree that 
something very interesting can happen when you're not looking at it. Um, and so that's always a bit of a juggling act. Um, I'm always very, very clear that if I hear the long-awaited-for galactic supernova has gone off, then all telescopes will be focused on that. I said those happen allegedly on average once per century, but frankly, we haven't had one of those since around the time that Wadham College was uh, founded. So, you know, we're overdue, but we're ready. Yeah, no, not too near, though, I hope. Thanks. <laughs> uh, another one from the floor, then we'll go back to the online. Do we have a hand? Back to Laura, okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, is this, yeah. Um, so when you're doing these monitoring campaigns, say of ANOVA, do you look at any other wavelengths as well, or do you just concentrate on optical uh, photometry and spectroscopy? Um, so my telescopes only observe in the optical, but for particular focused projects and programs, um, such as the verification of the prediction of the SS433 jet trace, um, then I called in the, the ALMA radio telescope. Um, that's a very high frequency radio telescope, very short wavelength radio telescope. But I also use um, a more traditional radio telescope called the Very Large Array, the VLA, um, in New Mexico. Um, sometimes use X-rays as well. Um, but, but those are very much on sort of external facilities. My telescopes only observe in the optical. Okay, I'm, I'm now going to do something absolutely horrible, but uh, I'm, I'm, and you don't have to do this. But any questions from the International School on the right, the visitors from there? Now is your chance. Anybody? No burning questions? Okay, okay, we don't have to take one from there. Oh, Roger. Oh, yeah, we have got one. We have got one. Here we go. Well done. Here we go. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was really interesting. Uh, I had a question about the Global Jet Watch. Is it accessible to everybody, and can everybody use it? Sorry, I slightly so missed your question. It is, was, it is it accessible to, uh, yeah, to everybody, and can jet anybody watch? use it? Jet, global yeah. Jet Watch. Um, is it? Not, yeah. as it's, not as it's currently configured at all. Yeah. Um, the main reason for that is the necessity to sustain observations. Um, mm. So I'm always open to, indeed, I've got, collaborations going with people in different parts of the world where they have a very important target that they're um, observing. But that's very much on a sort of ad hoc individual basis. It's, it's not something that I don't remotely have the resource to, to make it a, a common user facility in any sense. Okay. Thank but you. there are observatories around the world that schools can buy time and on access to and actually, they're not very expensive. So, you know, it, it's, I don't know the exact amounts, but if there are a number of, of uh, networks of telescopes that, that, that schools uh, can uh, get access to. So that is quite an interesting thing to, to try and do. Uh, should we see if there's anything online again? Uh, so James. we have loads of questions, so we're having to be quite selective. Um, but uh, I, I think one question which is important is, we have a question about how you might get into research if you were, for example, an undergraduate student in physics, but possibly also, you know, a school student who is interested in astronomy. What advice would you give to that generation? Uh, what, what age are we talking about, sorry? I think, I mean, the specific question is an undergraduate student who wants to get into research, but I think any advice for school age would also be interesting as well. So advice I would give to an undergraduate who's already reading physics, is that the... Yeah. Um, <coughs> is learn lots and lots of physics, as, as you yourself, James, know very, very well. Um, all, an awful lot of branches of physics are supremely relevant to astrophysics itself. And so my advice would be get stuck into relativity, get stuck into electrodynamics, get stuck into plasma physics, get stuck into instrumentation, learn everything you can while you're an undergraduate, and then find yourself a fun project. Um, to people at school, I would say the same thing. same thing. Getting a really broad basis in physics and in mathematics, and the doors are open to you. You can do an awful lot with that. We'll have one more from online. So, uh, Stephen is asking if you are planning on performing research with the James Webb Telescope. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
so um, my now graduated doctoral student, David Grant, um, uh, has taken up a postdoctoral position at the University of Bristol, and his, his day job is uh, working on um, planetary atmospheres being investigated by the James Webb Space Telescope. This is the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, of course, and uh, he and I have got some uh, projects, um, embryonic projects that we're talking about putting in proposals for. Most definitely, yes. Did an answer come back from Bill Phillips? Yes, yes it is the, the, the Bill Phillips you, are, you, are, you said. <laughs> Could you send a message back? <laughs> <Yes>. Hi, Bill. <laughs> Bill is a great friend of the Oxford Physics Department. Um, he was the uh, Eastman visiting professor mm. in, was it the late night? Was it when you were mm, head of Yeah, it was. I think it was. So late 2000s. Bill is a wonderful physicist. He's interested in everything. Um, he won the Nobel Prize <laughs> in <laughs> 1997. And my husband and I have an immense fondness for Bill. Because I don't know if you remember in February or March 2010, um, someone stepped on a volcano in Iceland and UK airspace was closed. We'd been having an Easter holiday uh, on, in Washington, D.C., and we were stranded. We couldn't get back home. Um, Bill gave us safe housing and uh, we're indebted to him. So, so maybe you could also say thanks, Bill, as well. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for all the questions. Um, uh, this uh, question of what advice you would give to a school child or an undergraduate who's interested in doing astrophysics or astronomy uh, and what to do, of course, the answer we always give is you should learn as much physics as possible. But this kind of begs the question, which is a good way to start a war in a physics department, which is, is astrophysics a branch of physics? Or is physics a branch of astrophysics? <laughs> so with that thought, I thank you so much for a wonderful lecture, Catherine. The questions, the range of questions illustrates how you captivated the audience. Uh, we are so grateful to you. Thank you very much.